I would like to um, thank uh, you and uh, wider in Ghana Research Center for inviting me uh, for this conference. I would like to focus uh, the South to South migration, but specifically targeting uh, women migrant workers uh, from South Asia to Middle East. As you know that uh, Asia consists of more, more than uh, half uh, mi migrants, migrant population, and Asia itself is very, very dynamic, and because of the disparities uh, that uh, we have, there are a lot of mobilities uh, of uh, labor migrants, but, not, but also irregular migration. And I would also talk about the challenges, some of the policy framework that we work, and possible uh, solutions uh, in linking with what, uh, what IOM does. So first of all, I would like to show you, share this uh, table, which shows the migration from uh, South Asia to the Middle East. The, the reason that I put this figure is that while there are a lot of South Asians going to East Asia and South, Southeast Asia, the labor market demands in the Middle East is still huge. And there are a lot of concerns of the uh, migrants' conditions, living and working conditions, uh, which was my focus of the paper, of vulnerability of uh, women migrants. So uh, although some of the uh, Middle, uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, especially with the Gulf Cooperation Councils, they have this uh, nationalization program, which is to encourage their nationals to, to, to be employed and reduce the numbers of foreign workers as much as possible. But then there are still large demand uh, for foreign workers. And especially with regards to women uh, migrant workers, it's huge. In terms of uh, domestic workers, there are large numbers of uh, 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 women uh, domestic workers heading to the Middle East. And for Middle Eastern countries, uh, trying to seek labors from South Asia, uh, from some countries like Bangladesh, uh, it's new because, uh, because some issues, human rights issues that they had, um, for example, from Indonesia migrants uh, beheaded or the Philippines and these governments, uh, they put restrictions on sending their workers to uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, so these, some Middle Eastern countries, they are now looking into some new labor uh, markets in South Asia. So what kind of um, uh, profile are we looking at? Um, as many of you know, there are these uh, women, the migrant workers, are most vulnerable. And uh, I, I, this table shows you some profile. And uh, the age group, for example, the average range, age ranges from 15 to 34 years, but generally less than 30 for women. Uh, education levels, lower secondary, secondary average levels are lower for women mostly primary education. Nature of work, low-skilled and semi-skilled laborers. Women are mostly unskilled, unskilled. Sectors of works that they are engaged are manual labor, domestic work, uh, some cases, construction, factories, services. Women migrate, migrate primarily for domestic work. And we see a lot of uh, vulnerabilities during their, uh, their time in destination countries. 
But my findings, and many of us uh, and many research point out, are the vulnerability starts from origin countries. Many uh, women migrants, they go from rural, con rural communities, uh, they have pets, and they, have, they, they, they seek means to, to be employed. Uh, I put some of the uh, factors uh, on these uh, women migrant workers, uh, the, 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 the profiles. Low level education, training, as I said, family background, uh, such as different class, economically lower income, little work experiences, although they seek uh, uh, employment opportunities abroad, very often these, work, these, these migrants, uh, women migrants, they don't have uh, a work experiences. And I have also uh, encountered women uh, who experienced physical and psychological abuse gender-based violence, sexual discrimination. And one of the reasons that uh, I interviewed, uh, from, the, from the interview that I had with uh, returned women migrants, were that they had to seek, they, 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 they had to run away because of these re re reasons uh, being uh, abused, and often uh, divorced. Low level of financial literacy, such as they do not have bank account, knowledge about money transfer, saving investment, very little. Little awareness of uh, recruitment procedures, and this becomes that they often become exploited uh, during the uh, recruitment phase. And they don't know how to uh, access to justice cultural and, and gender prejudices, no little experiences to go abroad, little knowledge about human rights, so they do not, very often they do not know what, what, to, what to ask for. Low level of trust, understanding toward government. Many women come from villages, as I said, where they do not have interactions of central government. Here for fear for police, no work at their home countries, and there is an urgent need to earn money for their families who either remain at home. So, what are the, what are the policy response that are happening now uh, to address these women's uh, problems? And of course, there are different levels of uh, migration governance um, that we try to, uh, to, to enhance. The global governance level, international conventions, um, UN convention, ILO's convention, domestic workers convention, which was created uh, uh, recently. Also, sustainable development goals, uh, we were able to integrate uh, specific objectives on uh, goals. Now we are looking at uh, global compact on migration. I think the previous speaker talked about it, but uh, what is this was the initiative came from the uh, New York Declaration, uh, September 2016. And what's going on right now uh, are that the national level consultations happened and happening, and regional level consultations are happening in uh, in, reg in, in, reg in uh, at the re regional level globally, in preparation for the global arena. There are numbers of uh, national and regional. Um, governance framework, and of course, the national development goal, uh, mainstreaming migration into development. Many countries of origin uh, of Asia, for example, they have uh, labor mig migration policies. 
Very interestingly, this is something that, uh, that we support greatly, is uh, regional consultative processes. Uh, for example, Colombo process, Abu Dhabi dialogue, uh, uh, Bali process. Because very often migration become very sensitive matter. They do not have, the governments, they do not have a, a formal binding process. So what, uh, what international community proposed was this informal, non-binding processes to share good practices but seek collaboration. For example, Colombo process, which is a ministerial consultation of labor sending countries. So 11 labor main labor, cent labor sending countries of Asia, they get together. The concept is, rather than compete against each other, let's unite, let's collaborate, and work together to, to, to ensure the rights of migrants. So these are very, very uh, important um, initiatives that they have. And uh, in addition to that, uh, in case of Asia, we have, uh, there are regional organizations, for example, ASEAN and SARC. And they are committed to uh, protect the rights of migrants. So there are instruments like uh, ASEAN uh, Declaration of Protection of Promotion of Rights of Migrants and also uh, SARC on uh, uh, child trafficking, for example. But the important thing is how these policy framework and policy uh, measures can be translated into uh, local, national, and local level. I will not get into this because uh, these are the SDG targets. I think uh, we can share my presentation later. So what I want to uh, discuss, and this is my final part, as a, uh, a practical recommendations that uh, recommendation that uh, we are working on is to establish a tool for recruiters, and the the vulnerability of uh, women migrant workers. It is. It, uh, it is very um, important to look into recruitment phase uh, in the case of South Asia because there are a lot of exploitations happening. There are lay layers of uh, sub-Asians and there are charging fees uh, that are often illegal. Uh, of course, not to mention some countries, they allow uh, gov they allow recruiters to, to, to charge money, but many women that uh, I encountered, they said that they had to pay uh, huge extra money. So this is as a suggestion to come up with a tool for recruiters to self-monitor, as a self-monitoring tool, for recruitment and placement agencies to provide services to women migrant workers to reduce vulnerability. And this tool, uh, I, we are thinking as a, uh, a, a e-platform, but that we, this, will con, con, this will be consist of a company profile, the national law according to the countries, that recruiters are registered and provide information on uh, international guidelines and tools, for example, Convention 181, ILO's general principles, IOM's international recruitment Inter integrity system, which is a multi-stakeholder certification for recruiters. Um, and DACA principle for migration with digni dignity, which was proposed by uh, IHRB. The self-assessment tool is going to, 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 to provide tool for recruiters to check 
whether they have, uh, uh, they did the due diligence and they did, did their best to ensure the gender sensitivity uh, in terms of uh, recruiting migrant work, uh, uh, women workers. And this tool, we are going, we are going to have a simple registration system and self-assessment check and test, and this can be an e-course to, to provide ultimately certificate or credential. Many recruiters, they uh, often have a very bad reputation and we have this uh, platform called WESPA, which is the association, network of association of recruitment agencies from uh, Colombo process countries. So we have this uh, network of recruiters to encouraging them to register themselves and do, to go through the self-assessment tool. And this, is, this will give the recruiters to improve their self-awareness and uh, educate themselves what the international st standards, guidelines, and tools. And this is, this is going, going to be tailor-made targeting some uh, South Asian countries. So these are the questions that I have that I'm not going to, uh, to, to uh, go through because of the time limitation. But each recruiter, they, they will go through the self-assessment tool and they will check. And this will relate it, this will give you, uh, this will give them a, a link to what kind of national legislations, international standards that they have. So, in conclusion, I would like to just uh, highlight four points here, which is importance in practical solution, converting global governance to, to, to the local, national, local level, which provides a direct assistance to migrants and their, their families. Support the enhancement, support the capacity um, of government stakeholders in managing migration. This, this is constantly important. Engage multi-stakeholders, um, private sector. In this case that we, uh, I discussed is engaging the private sector. NGO, uh, more and more diaspora migrants associations, they are they're playing a, a bigger role in migration issues. And continue to facilitate uh, bilateral and uh, multilateral dialogues. So this concludes my uh, presentation and I'm happy to uh, discuss further uh, if there are any uh, clarities, needs, and if there are any suggestions that you'd like to make. Thank you.